Good evening. We're back at it here on the Kaufman Corner Podcast with you as always, the uh, good doctor, Dr. Randy Giserly, founder, co-founder of uh, Baseball Prospectus. My name is Sarah Petra from Sports Radio 810 WHB. And Randy snatching victory from the jaws of defeat after putting defeat into the jaws of victory. Like this was everything we wanted in today's game of, of, for the Kansas City Royals. Still buried, still languishing. How are you doing tonight when it comes to your boys in blue? Well, I'm doing okay because uh, of my boys in red. I want to start with the shout out here to Liverpool Football Club. I got my jersey on, winners of the FA Cup. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, as somebody who roots for the Royals, the Chiefs, and, and Liverpool, it's so nice to have a team to root for with competent leadership, brilliant decision making, especially w- during the Chiefs' offseason. And I'm really worried what I'm going to do in two weeks when Liverpool's season is over and it's nothing but Royals all the time because. Uh, I'm already in stage three of the um, uh, ha- handling the decision to start this podcast with you. Stage one, you know, because you've been you've been talking to me about it for you know a year or more. You're trying to convince me to come back, come out of retirement. My stage one, I'm like, I was excited. I'm like, yeah, let's do this. The Royals are you know developing young talent. I think they're they're on the upswing. I'm excited to talk about them. And I think it took about two weeks for me to hit stage two, which was. How, how the hell did I let Seren talk me into this? And this is just going to be a slog. And this is just going to be terrible. And now I've come full circle because here we are five weeks in. And I'm like, thank God you convinced me to, to, to do this. Because without this hour of therapy every Sunday night, I don't know how I'd be able to get rid of all of the frustration I, I feel about this organization and, and this team right now. Um, and quietly, Salvador Perez's single in the ninth inning today may go down as one of the saving graces of the season. Uh, he's been saving the, the Royals bacon for, for 10 years now, 11 years. If they had lost this game today after being up six, nothing. And yeah, it's Coors field and weird stuff always happens in Coors field, but still to have lost today, they would have, that would have meant they would have lost consecutive series to the Texas Rangers, the Baltimore Orioles and the Colorado Rockies for a team that had designs on at least a winning record this season, if not contention. Um, so I, I, I don't. I think it's important not to let one, uh, you know, one hit in the ninth inning change our perception of this team, which is it's still a team with a lot of problems, and they got a lot of things to fix. Yeah, it is. Um, and and listen, there was a lot on the post game about how, you know, how big a win this was, best win of the year, biggest win of the year. I mean, it is a relief, right? It's like they were staring down what was the, you know. I, I don't know the end, like, like they did, you know, even Mike Matheny was talking about how big a win it was. Joe Goldberg and Jeff Montgomery talking about, Oh, the difference on the plane. And they're talking to Salvador Perez. I mean, it was relief. And, and I don't know how to take that. Uh, do I take that as this is a, a you know, a, a good win, just taking a face value for what they're saying, or do I take it as, I mean, they feel like their backs against the wall that like, it's, it's it, it, like they're fearing that they're about ready to fall off a cliff. Is, is, I think, one way you could look at it, couldn't you? Yeah, well, they should. I mean, they were, they're, even with this win, they're 12 and 20. I mean, they would have been 11 and 21. Um, and, you know, we're getting close to that mythical 40 game mark where you can evaluate a team the best the Royals can be. If they, they, they rip off an eight wins in a row, they'll be at 500. But they're looking at being 13 and 27, 14 and 26. You know, if the 27th or 28th best record in all of baseball at the 40 game mark. And, you are what you are at that point. That's what Dayton Moore likes to talk, tell us. And and I think he's mostly right about that. So, and, and as we've talked about it pretty much every week on this show, there aren't a lot of, you know, hidden silver linings. If you break down the stats on this team, they, the, 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 the offense, you know, we, we, as much as we talk about how bad the pitching has been, at least there are some, some really good performances in the bullpen, which we'll talk about more. Um, but the offense is quietly a real problem. And, you know, it's not like this is a, a, a team you think about like the 2011 team where they're breaking in Eric Cosmer and Mike Moustakis early in the season. And, you know, these are guys, well, you know, they're getting their feet wet. Aside from Bobby Witt, I mean, this most of this lineup is what, you know, established guys where you don't expect a, a huge adjustment period where they're going to start getting better suddenly. Um, the, the longer this goes on, the more you have to look at this team as a 95 loss team in the making. And that's unacceptable at, at this point in the rebuild. Is it unacceptable? I mean, is it is there a, a mark that you've got that you say, okay, this year, if you're not here, then that's it. We're we're blowing everything up. I mean, or or is that still a year off? 
Well, when you talk about blowing things up, here's the thing. At this point, we're, we're not talking about, oh, is, uh, have the world's reached the point where Dayton Moore needs to fire Mike Matheny? I, I think I, I, I think we're beyond that at this point. The, the question is, is it, the, if there is a, a weakness or a hole in organization, I don't think it starts at the managerial level. I don't think Mike Matheny is the problem. I think he may be a problem, but strangely, the, the, the reason why he may be a problem is not for all the reasons I was worried about hiring him in the first place, which was his tactical acumen or his clubhouse skills. I think he's been perfectly mediocre in both of those. I think he's been fine. I, I don't think he's been an issue. The issue with Mike Matheny, if there is one, is simply his loyalty to coaches who have not demonstrated a baseline level of competence to be coaches at the major league level. Um, that's the issue there. But to me, the fundamental issue here is the Royals are a small market team that can't win unless they develop young talent. And they are not developing young talent. And, you know, you look back at the the, the pennant winning teams of 2014 and 2015, that all started with 2011. And not everybody that they brought up in that huge youth movement back then worked out, but enough of those guys worked out. Hosmer was decent right away. The stock is was decent, then regressed, but was still, you know, playable. Danny Duffy was on that team. Salvador Perez came up late that year and was a revelation. Um, and I'm not sure we're seeing that with this team, especially with the young pitching, where you can say, with the exception of Daniel Lynch, where you can say these are guys are difference makers that are going to be, you know, the, the core of a pennant winning team in three or four or five years. All right. Uh, why? Why Why can you not? And, and I will offer this and I know you're going to resist, but I, I will offer this up because, listen, I don't want to. I've said it uh, numerous times. I'm not just going to sit and bash away unless, you know, if I can find something positive to say about what's going on, I'm going to do it. And I don't know if this is positive as much as it is. Sometimes we don't see the light through the darkness. Right. So I went back and looked, okay, 2012, right? 13, they won 87 games. 14 was a AL pennant year. 15 was a world championship. 16 and 17, they were contending into September. So there was a five year window of contention. What did it look like in 12? 72 and 90, right? Not good. This team very much in a range where 72 and 90 could be the outcome. And, and, but I think the difference is as we sit here, and I think this is where we sat in 2012, we couldn't see it because we didn't see those players as championship players. And I am completely now of the idea that maybe we've got a, you know, um, you know we're, we're going to look back even more so and say, as much as I, I love, I, I hate to give Joe Sheehan a little credit, but, and a lot of the numbers guys saying, okay, maybe that was just a little bit of a fluke, just a little bit lucky right now they did things. But by the uh, way, I should, let me just point out, Joe Sheehan actually texted me after, uh, after you told you, you admitted to him that he was right about the world being a fluke. And I think it was one of the highlights of his career. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to be clear for, that both you and I have, have come to admit that he might have had a point. There, there was a point to it. I mean, I, I don't want to take away any of the successes uh, that the Royals organization put together, but, it, but, it, but like, listen, they've done that. That's not me. Right, the Royals have, have made it now with five years of dismal baseball. What what appears to be a fifth year of dismal baseball now since uh, they they were playing competent baseball or at least competitive baseball. How can you not look at from you know six to twelve and and then uh, you know eighteen to twenty two? I mean, the, the, that's that's that bookends. You know, that's a huge stuff. sample size. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I I would be I I would be a liar if I didn't say that. Yes, all the evidence is pointing there. Now, if they have a five year competent run, it looks like it took them six years to get it going. It they can compete for five years, and it takes them five years to rebuild it, and they can play for five years. Let, let let's see what happens over the next five years. But but I just wanted to go through this. I did this on my radio show as well. I mean, the, the 12 top players that baseball reference, you know, they give the photos of, of all the guys that were the biggest impact guys, which it's fun now to see all the different uniforms everybody's wearing on these photos now. Uh, but Alex Gordon, with, with, this is based on their war. Alex so this Gordon is was the their 2012 team, correct? 2012 team. Okay. Alex Gordon was their best player. Alcides Escobar was their second best. That's a problem, right? And that's part of the reason why they were 72 wins. Mike Moustakas, third. Billy Butler, fourth. Salvador Perez, five. Six was Kelvin Herrera. Jeremy Guthrie was seven. Luis Mendoza was eight. <laughs> Greg Holland was nine. Felipe Paulino, ten. Eleven was Lorenzo Cain. And twelve 
was Gerard Dyson. I think this is a worthwhile exercise because if you want to find a silver lining about this ball club right now, what you would say is, look, that team, Mike Moustakis was a bust. By the way, also on that team was Eric Cosmer, Danny Duffy. They didn't crack the top 12 uh, for the team. Tim Collins in relief. These are other guys that would go on to be a part of the World Series team. Chris Getz was playing. I don't know if you remember the Chris Getz. I, I mean, I don't know. Every other day I had to talk about Chris Getz uh, on, he on was, the radio. He was the Ryan O'Hearn of the 2012 yeah, Royals. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Jeff Brancourt was still dragging his slow bat up to the plate um, and not making much uh, happen. Unieski Betancourt was still on the team. I mean, there were, there were definitely mm. problems. But like I said, in addition to the guys I mentioned, Hosmer, Duffy, Tim Collins, Luke Kochaver, I was on the team. Jake Odorizzi and Jeremy Jeffers got cups of coffee. They would be part of a trade. Um, when you look at this, you say, okay, there's a major, there's some kind of impact acquisition that needs to be made, whether they're going to splash around some cash and sign an impact arm or something. But largely a lot of the team was there. It just didn't look as good as the sum would be. And I, and I will admit, and I think, it, man, what a sweet spot for the Royals to put it all together because the Red Sox and Yankees we're on a down slope, uh, down, uh, downswing. And so it, it made it a little bit easier uh, for the Royals to get that the Rays hadn't perfected what they've perfected now. Um, but that is a reason to think that, well, because Bobby Wood Jr. is not hitting, maybe he's the Mike Moustakis, right? Because right now we're not getting, you know, Kyle Isbell isn't tearing the cover off the ball. Could he be Gerard Dyson, right? Could he be that kind of player that is, is going to be better? He's not going to be one of the bricks, but he could be one of the more, you know, Felipe Paulino, wasn't that his name? No, no. Mm -hmm. No, not Felipe Paulino. Who, Paulo Orlando was, oh. was an outfielder on a pennant-winning team and even a championship team. Was he on that 15 team as well? I think he might have been. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, I, I, I don't want to just say everything they do is wretched because that looked wretched as well. And as we know now, that was not a wretched collection of talent. No, it wasn't. And certainly that is – not only the the model for what the Royals are trying to accomplish now, but they are the success of that rebuilding process, that youth movement, it is the reason why it has taken this long for me for the scales to sort of fall out of my eyes. We were talking about uh, uh, with Joe Sheehan claiming that that. that pennant winning the, those two pennant winning teams were a bit of a fluke and i i refuse to believe that until maybe as recently as this season because what they accomplished there was so special that at, even afterwards even after they disappointed the 2016 2017 even after the rebuilding process went was harder than expected 100 lost seasons back-to-back -back years and slower to rebuild than i mean a lot of other teams have been through re a rebuilding cycle in two or three seasons um and, you know, the Royals, are, it always seems to take them five or six years. But I was willing to give them that time because of how successful, you know, they, they earned themselves so much credibility in 2014 and 2015 with me. I, I, I Believe it or not, I don't enjoy, like, mocking the organization and insulting them and saying that they don't know what they're doing. And it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I've, so I'm starting to lose faith in them because – they they earn so much credibility then. But here's the thing: in 2012, you talk about all you mentioned all those players. That was that that was the the lion's share of that incredible farm system in 2010. The went into the 2011 season with I think nine top hundred prospects on Baseball America's list, unprecedented in, in major league history. And even though those guys were struggling in 2012, those were the same guys who were top hundred prospects the year before. So let's go back to that 2012 team and look at those guys. Just just look at their ages, uh, especially the hitters. Salvador Perez, 22. Eric Hosmer, 22. Alcides Escobar, the veteran, 25. Mike Moustakis, 23. Alex Gordon, grizzled veteran, 28. Billy Butler, grizzled veteran, 26. Lorenzo Cain, 26. Gerard Dyson, 27. Now look at this team. Who, who, who name the guys on this team that are 25 or younger? You've got Bobby Witt. He's 22. Kyle Isbell's 25 and basically a pinch runner at this point. MJ Melendez is 23. 
and you know is on the roster right now. But as soon as Kim Gallagher gets him off, off comes off the IL, I assume he'll be sent back to the minors. And the only other 25 or younger hitter to have appeared is Sebastian Rivera, who played in one game. Um, you know. One game as as you know, I think in the doubleheader as the twenty seventh man. Now the Royals do have some twenty five and younger guys on the in the rotation or in, on, on the pitching staff. Carlos Hernandez is twenty five. Daniel Lynch is twenty five. Chris Bubich is twenty four. Um, Dylan Coleman is twenty five. Brady Singer is still twenty five. Jonathan Easley, who just came up, is twenty five. Jackson Coar is twenty five. And I think that's the point: is that there it, there are that that collection of twenty five and under talent is in the organization, but it's mostly guys who are not contributing yet they are or they in the case of some of those pitchers they're guys who were expected to be contributing and have actually regressed and are back in Omaha but most of the talent is still in triple a AAA or double a it's still you know we didn't mention Nick Nick Prado would qualify Nick Prado's 23 Vinny Pasquantino is 24 right you got some of the guys in double a Michael Massey and, and Nick Lofton that may be the comp to the 2012 team but then that makes this not the 2012 team this is more like the 2010 team all right, so and if that's the case, um, then what's the play here, right? Like, is the play that thinking, you know, trading for major league ready talent is a fool's errand? I always think it is. I think you, you, I think you swallow hard and you take the the biggest amount of talent in return as far off as it has to be. Always when you're a small market club, always, and you try to fill in with, with some some solid signings and free agency, some quality trades where you can, but you always just keep and and if you will just be patient, right? Then eventually your system will fill up to the point that you're always putting in, you know, your share. First of all, I don't think you want. There was a problem with that team. Let's do. Let's back up and say there was a problem that all those guys were the same age, right? If your goal, and and I don't know that it should be your goal. But Dave Moore stated that one of his goals in, in putting this team back together uh, was that he wanted it to be more sustainable. He didn't want it to be a window that they had to, you know, crash down to a hundred loss season again. You know, I, I would say he wanted to be more like the Cardinals or or the Rays have been of late. I don't know if the Rays can keep doing it, but so far so good. They keep sustaining it. But the Cardinals, I think, would be the the gold standard of of getting good in a non top ten market and staying good. And creating the love affair with your fan base and fueling the money that you know, fueling the the passion for the fans that gives you the money to to go get a gold Schmidt and go get what you need, right? That's what you want. Okay, so if that's the plan, then it should they shouldn't all be the same age because if they're all the same age, you're you're, you're just doing another window where they're all going to expire again, where you can't keep them. So from that standpoint, I'll be a little bit more tolerant. If Edward Olivares can play, if Kyle Isbell can play, you talk about the under 25, Isbell's 25, Olivares is 26. They're they're not in that under 25 range you're talking about, but they're just beyond it and they have team control. And so if they're not all going to be due up at the same time, then that's not a bad thing. But I think the scary part to your point is that, that these guys just, they're not going to be Moustakas, Hosmer. They're not going to be as good. They're just getting here to the big leagues now because they're just not as good a player. That's the scary part, is is it not? Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, think about it. I mean, Eric Hosmer, Mike Moustakas, those were top 10, top 20 prospects in all of baseball. And with the exception of Bobby Witt Jr., the Royals don't have – none of their prospects have been evaluated at that caliber. And when you think about even being top 10 prospects in all of baseball, Mike Moustakas has had a very solid career. Eric Hosmer, long, solid career. They're going to have, you know – large raw totals he's playing 1500 games in his career or whatever but never was a superstar at his best was a above average regular player so if you can't develop a top 10 prospect into a superstar you're probably not going to be developing the top 50 top 100 guys into a superstar so you need more of them you need more more guys to compensate for the lack of elite talent. And part of that is, you know, they have the number two pick, the number three pick. Bobby Witt was the number two pick. When you have a pick that high, it's almost hard to, to, to miss on them. Um, but when, to get back to your point about uh, you don't want them all to come at the same time, you don't want them all to be the same age because you create a window. To me... If, if that's your goal, I'm not, you're putting the, those words in my mouth. Well, I'm well, stating no, uh, what, I, what I understand. they were doing. Well, my, my point is that, that we, we, the, it's a sort of a euphemism. When you say, oh, all these guys are coming at the same time, the way to avoid that is to just keep developing new talent every year. To say that all of our talent's coming at one time is a nice way of saying we got it, we got, we got it right for like two years in a row in the draft, and that's it. Like if you're, if you're 
drafting a one future everyday player in the draft, if you pick one every single year, you're never going to have that wave because you're, you're bringing in new talent. Saying you have a wave is a nice way of saying that the well has gone dry. Right? And that's what happened to the Royals, right? They they hit a, a gusher of prospects in the draft from 2007 to 2010 or so. And then starting around 2010, you know, their first round picks are just it was Bubba Starling and Christian Cologne and Kyle Zimmer. And- I, I think I think you're over. It's one of the reasons why I've landed on the the I have to give uh, some credit to Joe Sheehan that they got a little bit lucky because I don't even they didn't hit a gusher of prospects. I mean, I, I think that's overstating it. They, they hit like three guys, and Alex Gordon finally came around. Well, you know? I was going to say some of the and, the gusher was actually Allard Baird's Allard Baird's gusher with Butler and Gordon and Cranky yeah. and making smart trades to turn those into yeah. more talent. I agree. Well, with. no, not not even that. I mean, you know, Ned Yost's comments lead me to believe that Zach Cranky forced him to make a trade. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, it, it, they may not even have had Escobar and Kane. Well, that, that, that gets back to one of the things we want to talk about today, which is, you know, the Royals, the clock is ticking on some of the guys they have now who have a lot of talent. And, you know, we talked about already Zach, the current Zach Cranky, <laughs> the 38-year-old Zach Cranky, and whether they should trade him, and Andrew Benintendi, we talked about last week about how they should be looking to trade those guys now. Like, the, the Royals seem to always have a problem just accepting reality whether it is that a certain you know player on the roster has no business being on the roster it took them a while to do that with chris bubich it it's taking them a lot as of, as we speak carlos hernandez is still on the active roster i believe and you know two weeks ago i w- i was tweeting about how he had no business being in a major league rotation because he had 13 walks and eight strikeouts right in his first four starts of the season he walked more batters then, then he had strikeouts in three of them. Do you know how hard it is in 2022 in Major League Baseball to have more walks than strikeouts? And he was doing it every single start. Like he was showing not even a glimmer of hope. There, there was never even a discussion that we're going to take him out of, the, uh, out of the rotation. You know, finally now, you know, after his, his latest bombing in, in Colorado, yes, ERA is 9.11. And I don't know if the Royals are calling the police, but hopefully they will call Omaha and send him there. Um, But the Royals need to accept they're not going to the playoffs this year, which means you can start the process of selling assets now. And there is a, you know, a luxury in knowing this early in the season, whether you are a buyer or a seller, because especially now with 12 playoff teams, there's going, by definition, more teams are going for it. There's going to be more buyers and fewer sellers. That puts you in a good position if you're willing to trade. And forget Greinke and Benintendi. I think at some point the Royals have to decide what are they going to do with Brad Keller? Because Brad Keller may, may be the most valuable asset, certainly if you if you don't count like the, the, the rookies or, or, you know, Daniel Lynch, I guess, who's a sophomore. Brad Keller is the most valuable commodity that it could be reasonably traded. He's, he's back to number three starter, maybe number two starter form. He's going to be a free agent at the end of next season. And you can get a heck of a lot more talent for a guy when it, when the team that you're trading him to has control of him for two pennant races instead of one. And Uh, I don't, I just don't think it's even on the world's radar. And if, look, if they're going to sign him to a long-term deal, great. I I would be willing to consider keeping, I'd love to have Red Keller around in a world's uniform if the price is right for three, four or five years, but you have to make a decision. You can't just let his service time peter out without deciding is are, are you're going to fish or cut bait. Uh, I, I will um, object a little bit. I, listen, if you can get a good haul of return on Brad Keller, I think you do it because I don't think he's as good as people think he is. Right? Like, first of all, his fielding independent pitching uh, is is four oh eight, right? Compared to a two seven ERA. Like he's really last year he had a 472. This year he has a 408. Last year's real ERA 539. This year 270. Oh my God, he's fixed. He's got it all. He's really not that different. He's better. Don't get me wrong. He's better. But when you see 22 strikeouts in 36 and two thirds innings, if somebody will give you a decent haul for Brad Keller, I think you take it because I, I think Brad Keller, he's not a two. Nobody who strikes out that few of batters is a two. Can we agree on that? I, I would agree. I would say he's number three. He's a unique guy because he's never really been a strikeout pitcher, and yet he's 
you know, is it, is it, what his fifth season in the majors now or fourth? Let me. I, 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 fifth I, season. He had one bad year, and the reason is he's a ground ball guy. And you look at yeah, his fifth this year is four oh eight. That's because his home run. He's given up four homers in thirty seven innings. He's actually not a home run guy because his ground ball rate is so high. And his ground ball rate, that's what I look at more than even their home run rate. His ground ball percentage is back up to 51%. It's over 50% again this year. It was down a little bit last year. His career rate is 51, uh, exactly, 51%. And any any pitcher with a ground ball rate over 50%, that's a, that's a strong ground ball pitcher. And you, if you, especially if you put him on, on, on a team with a good infield defense, like the Royals have, he's going to be more effective than his FIP is going to suggest. I'm comfortable. I don't think he's a 270 ERA guy. But I'm comfortable saying he's a 3.50 ERA guy. He's a league average, maybe slightly above av- league average starting pitcher, who's also durable and has really had no significant injury concerns. He and, and he's efficient in the mound, so he, he's averaging six innings to start, which in 2022 is like you know Iron Man McGinnity over here. Um, so I think he has value. I don't think he's going to get you an ace hole, but could he get you a top hundred prospect? Yeah, I think he could. If you're a playoff team, does he? May is he one of your one two threes when you get into if, the postseason? If you're if, if if you're a team trying to get into the playoffs, if you're the, again, this gets back to what we talked about with like the Dodgers. If the Dodgers, then no. But if you are the White Sox right now with all the injuries that they've had, probably uh, you know, he's going to start a no, playoff no, series. No. When you if get if you're if you're good enough to get into the postseason, he's not getting the ball one of those three days. You, I mean, like you made the statement. You said, "Well, he's only had the one bad season." What the hell is a good season? I mean, all these other ones are good seasons in your mind? Well, his ERA, look at just his ERA plus year by year since his rookie season. 140, remember, 100 is average. Above 100 is, is better than average. 140, 114, 189. And every, and every, year, has to be, and every year has to be shut down in September. Some of that, some of that I do want. There was at least one year where the Royals – just shut him down because they were like 30 games out of, out of first place. And there was just no point in, you know, using him. Like uh, I think a lot of this is extreme conservatism on a team that just didn't want to take any chances and had nothing to play for. Listen, I, I I think he's pitching really well right now. If you can get, I, I think it comes down to Brad Keller. There's perpetually a for sale sign in his front yard, but this is my point. And, and you, this is what we want. And if we get offered this, we take it. If we get but, offered this, he keeps pitching. But this is my point. I don't think he. I don't think there is a for sale sign. And I'm not saying sell him. I'm saying figure out what you're doing with him, because you're not going anywhere this year. You might have, you know, you might have a chance if you if you legitimately think you're going to be in the playoffs in 2023, then maybe you keep him around. Or if you want to sign him long-term because you think that he is a part of your rotation, that he's going to be a good starting pitcher in the major leagues for two or three years beyond his his uh, his free agency, then that that's great. Sign him. But you have to make a decision. The Royals are so good at just pushing off the decision of how to maximize a, a player's value to the organization until that value is almost gone. And I just would love to see them be more proactive. I think we're on the same page and I'm fine with being proactive and seeing what's out there and saying, listen, we're open for business, but I I can also see people looking at it like Brad Keller is kind of the David Jesus of starting pitching. Right. And what I always said about him was if you're sitting there and you're coming down the stretch and and you don't have a right fielder, or you don't have a left fielder uh, or you kind of got an outfield DH spot and you're like, damn, we got to find somebody. We got to quit playing this 180. You know, we don't have anybody for the minors. And you go, David DeHace is available. Really? Oh, yeah, let's get him. You're thrilled. A professional at bat, good on base. No real pop, but play a pretty good center, you know, defense. You even run him out there in center field, play, cover some ground in the, on the corners. And then the moment you have him, you're like, God, we got to have somebody who hits the ball over the wall, don't we? Like, I mean, we got to be able to find somebody better than David DeJesus. Like, that's Brad Keller to me, right? For the Royals, he has, he has, Great value because you can't develop anything else if you're constantly getting your ass kicked and down seven nothing in every game. Like that's hard to develop in ball games that don't mean something. You need to play games where every play matters, where it's not like so what? It's an air. We're down six one anyway. Who cares? He has that value for them. But and I think a team that goes, we just lost our guy. We have no one for our fifth spot. Brad Keller's available. Oh, dude, let's go get him. See, that analogy breaks down to me. It would it would work 
if every team had to play seven outfielders because then every team would be like, well, we've got four great outfielders, but we got three who are not so good. Every team needs, like you just said, five starting pitchers. I, I think Brad Keller would be an upgrade in the number five spot for every team in baseball except the Dodgers and maybe the Rays. And- Today, this year, but not necessarily next year. Based on his career path, he'll be a turd next year. <laughs> well, if you think he's going to be a turd in a year, then yeah, I wouldn't trade for him. And if the Royals thought he thinks he's going to be a turd in a year, they should be trying to trade him for anything. But I, my, I don't. I, I think I'm just saying don't like, love, you don't, don't compare him. him. You can't compare him to an ace. You can't even compare him to a number three. You have to compare him to whoever he would be replacing in a rotation, which right. is the worst guy in the rotation. So I think he has value there. And that's how. That's why you know you can't have too much pitching. The idea is you need five starters, whereas you only need one right fielder. So if you have a good right fielder, you're out of the market for David Hayes. If you have three good starting pitchers, you're still in the market for a fourth. Well, listen, none of us love ERA as a stat, but we all know what the scale is, right? So we all got a feel for what it means. 308, 308, 419, 247, 539, 2.7, right? What's coming next year? 495. That's what's coming next year, right? Like, that's what that says. I, I, I we're, we're on the same page. I just think the idea of holding the Royals that they have to find something for him. Like I, the reason why I would move him is, is because I, I don't think he's, you know, this isn't Saberhagen or Gubaza or Leonard or a pillar in, in your rotation. The, the, he is closer to Jeremy Guthrie than he is one of those guys. That was an anchor and a pillar to your rotation. But to your point, if somebody's going for it, and there's a general manager who's that my butt's on the line. I got to win this year, and he has a starter go down. Then you may get a guy who overpays, and you take it. That's why I say the for sale signs out there every day, all day. Well, and and that is really my point. My point isn't the specific decision. What do they do with whether they trade Brad Keller or they they keep him? It's the process. And I just I don't I haven't seen evidence from this organization of what you and I are doing right now, which is should we extend him or should we trade him? But the the one option you cannot choose is do nothing and just let his contract expire. And then you're two months away from free agency and you realize, oh, geez, we're 18 games out again and let's trade him for for, an arm and and enable. And I just do anything else. I, I want to put this up here. And by the way, if you're uh, catching us via the podcast later on, as we had somebody who pieced out, I think it was Chris who was uh, piecing out and headed off the bed. I uh, said he'd catch us on the uh, podcast on the way to work. If you're catching us via the podcast, we stream live 10 o'clock central time. Uh, you can catch us on YouTube, Twitch, uh, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, it's where the uh, video comes up. And of course, we'd appreciate it if you'd hit the like, hit the love button, smash that. Doesn't cost nothing, but it helps us out a lot. So if you could put that, if you do enjoy the podcast and the uh, stream, make sure you, uh, you, you give us the the, uh, good compliments there. We would really appreciate it. I, I, I want to go to to something that that KMCMC uh, said. He said Brad Keller would have started for the fourteen fifteen Royals in the playoffs. He would have started for one of them. The other one he would have sucked. Right. That's my point. It's like we all we we see only what's happening right now, and there's the big picture of it. That that's my point about the twelve Royals. Everybody thought those guys were trash. They were all trash. Right, except for Gordon, who was starting to hit and was winning Gold Gloves in left field, people had finally come around. But but the the mantra then was, well, yeah, maybe Hosmer will be good after six years. Like Gordon, even Gordon, there was angst because of how long it took him to finally start playing. That's my point. My point is, you know, Keller. We we went when Keller sucks, they don't know pitching. They're idiots, and there's no pitcher on this team that's worth anything. So that was last year. This year he's going well, and it's like, no, no, this guy's nails. He, he'd have been well, mowing down in the season. Because Keller is not a strikeout guy, I think he's a guy who is more dependent on his defense. I, he, he's as going to be as good as the team around him. I don't think it's a coincidence that last year with Hunter Dozier playing a lot of third base, that he was you know had his worst season. Whereas this year with Bobby Witt out there, and you know they've got you know Nicky Lopez back at back at shortstop. You know, a better infield defense. I think that's playing a big part. Michael Taylor, even in center field, like he, the, even even if if they don't hit a ground ball, they're putting the ball in play. So my point is, a competitive team, a contending team, presumably has better talent around him. This is not a guy you get who's going to single handedly win you games. But on a team that's already good, I think Brad Keller will play to the level of his teammates more than a more strikeout uh, dependent pitcher. 
I, I, yes, I, I will grant you that the you know guys who can feel the ground ball better are going to help him above fifty percent. Look, that should be on the marketing brochure for the Royals when when they're when they're sending around to the to the the other teams in baseball. So, I mean, I, I listen. I, I think it's I think it's a valid point, but I, I also just think, I mean, do, would you sign him? That we're not talking about a guy who's this isn't James Shields inning load that's there. Like may, maybe we can, like for me. I know what his worth is. Like I said, for sale sign every day, it's there. You come make me an offer. I'm listening to all offers. This is what he costs. You want to pay that cost? You can have him. That would be my mindset right now until I get into a race and I and I'm mixing it up for something. Then now you got to come pay. Now now he's not for sale. Now you got to come pay for him. But like, are, do you believe that? What five years of Brad Keller? Like, what are you talking about when you say sign? Like, what what's what's what kind of deal are you looking at? I think right now, given that he'll be a free agent, you know, you have one more year before free agency. I, I would imagine it would take a four-year contract, buying out that one year, and then basically a three-year extension on top of that. So a four-year contract that starts next year. That's ages 27 to 30. We're not talking about a, an old guy. I mean, he was a Rule 5 pick, so he was 22 as a rookie and had to stick in the major leagues and did so. Um, as to whether I would do it, uh, what I would do, is bring in a whole new pitching coach operation and find out if he could be even better with better instruction. My concern is if you let him go in an organization that has proven, has taken guys off the garbage heap and turned them into good pitchers can, you know, get a hold of him and they get a guy who's got undeniable talent, you know, could he find a strikeout pitch? You know, this is a guy who, the problem, the, the reason, one of the reasons why he does, isn't a strikeout guy is, like a lot of starters here, he has difficulty developing a third pitch. He doesn't have a third pitch, and he's slow. If you look at the, I was looking at fan graphs earlier, his changeup percent, the percentage of pitches he throws that are changeups has been slowly trickling up over the years because he's basically a fastball slider guy. He's got two different kinds of fastballs, so in a way he's got three pitches, but having having something with arm side run, as they say, right? A, a pitch that moves down and in to right-handed batters would be such a huge compliment to his slider that is so good going down and away uh, to, to right-handed batters. And his change of percentage, according to to, uh, to Fangraphs, is 4.1% as a rookie, 0.4%, 2.9%, 5.4%. This year is 7.1%. So he is technically throwing it more, but he's still throwing his third best, his third pitch, you know, only 7% of the time. He hasn't developed a great a, a great changeup. Maybe it's better than Brady Singer's, but it's still he needs a third pitch. And maybe in an organization that could develop that third pitch, he he would start missing bats. And if you give me Brad Keller with a strikeout rate that's twenty percent better than it is now, suddenly now you do have an, a potential number two star. Yeah, he, he he'd go to the Giants like like everybody else, and and would would be better. Um, I mean, I, I think that's that's what would happen. I, I I grant you that. Like at some point, somebody in this uh, organization has to make somebody better. We said this a couple of uh, podcasts ago that you know every story that's ever written about every anyone in this organization making progress always comes with who outside of the organization helped them. Yep. I mean, it, it's clockwork. Alec Lewis at the Athletic will write a story. Oh, he's he's he, this is how he's got his his new hitting thing is this, and he learned it. This pass off season over at this place, way the hell away from the Royals. He got completely the hell away from the Royals, and now they think he's made progress. And, and, and by the way, shout out to Alec Lewis who uh, wrote a wrote a excellent column. Was it I think on Monday? You 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 have those columns that you remember when when someone f sort of finally calls out an organization and it sort of lays the uh, the mistakes that they're making bare for all to see. And to me, the the quintessential example of this. Um, I'm sure you recall was uh, Kent Babb's uh, column on the Kansas City Chiefs in the the waning days of the Scott Pioli era. Mm -hmm. um, the, the you know the rapper in the stairwell. I think that's all I really have to say. That that tells everybody you know what you need to know. It was less a column and more an expose. But I, I truly believe that the Kansas City Chiefs do not fire Scott Pioli. Hire Andy Reid, draft Patrick Mahomes, and are where they are today. That that column played an enormous part, in it. and then this, um, I don't think Alec Lewis. It wasn't an expose. That's actually what made it more devastating. It was simply bearing the facts of the matter, the statistics, the fact that the team is not hitting, is not pitching, um, and there was a oh, there was a 
an absolutely devastating line, um, a very understated line, which I I can pull it up. It's one where players within the organization are starting are not unaware not unaware of how they you know other organizations are developing you know their players you know to perform better. So that yeah, it was a great line, and, and to me, I think the way we all read it was. You know, there are guys here that that know Jacob Junis and are saying, why the hell don't we have somebody who can do for me what the Giants are doing for Jacob Junis? Exactly. I mean, we have the, we have our minor league minute uh, every week. I, I feel like we need we also need a Jacob Junis minute um, to just review what he's done in the last week. So let, let's do our Jacob Junis okay. minute right now. So the, the, he made another start for the, the Giants. He made two relief outings, five, perf- five shutout innings in each, moved into the rotation with five innings in his first uh, start with two runs allowed. Uh, and then this week, uh, it was uh, last uh, yesterday, he went five and two-thirds, six hits, two two runs again, one walk, three strikeouts. He got took the loss, but two runs and five and two-thirds innings, another excellent outing. His ERA for the season is 1.74. And I, I want to throw a, um, uh, a, a perspective um, wager at you, just a friendly kind of uh, uh, guess here. At the end of the season, who do you think will have more wins above replacement using baseball reference, uh, baseball reference to stat? Jake Junis or any member of the Royals pitching staff? And before you answer, keep in mind that right now, Jake Junis has 1.0 wins above release. He's been worth one win to the Giants, which is pretty impressive in 21 innings. All right? I mean, you take you extrapolate that to 210 innings, that'd be 10 wins. That'd be, you know, they're... That's a that's that Grinky in 2009. He's not going to be that good. But the point is, he's already got one win above replacement. Right now, the pitcher who leads the Royals in wins above replacement is Brad Keller, also 1.0. So Jake Junis has basically been as valuable to the Giants as any member of the Royals pitching staff has been to this point in the season. And they let him go for nothing and had two more years of club control for him. I, I will point out that April and March, Mar, you know, which which he's I know we're in May, but he didn't get April and March. So early in the year has been uh, his second best month. August has been a good one as well. Uh, we've seen him come out hot and then fall apart. So let's remain patient. I'm not ready to proclaim Jacob Junis fixed. If you give me the if you give me the field of the Royals, like I, I, I would probably take the field just because the math is on my side. But your point is a valid one. If you ask me to take a guy, Brad Keller's the only guy, really that you could go with because we expect Zach Cranky to be dealt. Uh, he better be dealt uh, at some point here by this team. Uh, so yeah, your 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 point's a good one, and that's devastating uh, to the management of the Royals. Which, and and they had listen, they can develop relievers. Why, and I've got my theory on why they can develop relievers, but they can't starters because they pour so much resources, in, so many resources into pitching. Relievers are what's left over from failed starters. And they've got so much that they pour into starting pitching that nobody puts more into a bullpen basically than the Royals. I mean, we, we I think we, I don't know if it was, if I t- talked about this with you, but you know, even you go back to their, you know, some of their other great bullpens, you know, Duffy's throwing BBs, supposed to be a starter. Ho Chaver, 1 1 as a starter. Like, oh, he was part of that great bullpen. That was, it was a dismal, I mean, I, and I love Luke Ho Chaver, the guy. And, and that's fine. These things happen, but you can't have this great bullpen that's filled with all these massive resources. Like, I have no doubt the Royals are going to have a great bullpen in two years. Asa Lacey, will set up, you know, <laughs> Mazzucato will be the long guy. You know, Coar will be a long guy. It'll be all these first-round picks. You're like, yeah, damn. I mean, it, it, it ought to be good. Jesus, every first-round pick they've made for five years is in their bullpen right now. It ought to be one hell of a bullpen. Well, let's, let's not forget the most dominant, most important reliever in, you know, recent Royals history. That's sort of the totem of their entire championship run was Wade Davis. Wade Davis only moved to the bullpen because he was absolutely awful as a starting pitcher in 2013. I mean, you can create an alternate history where the Royals make the playoffs in 2013 if they didn't have Wade Davis on the roster because he had like an area of like five and a half. And they moved him into the bullpen in September. He had succeeded as a reliever in Tampa Bay for one year. They, he had one year of success already doing it under his belt. But they traded for him to be a starter. And if he had been 
uh, an average, if he had had a 380 ERA, he never would have moved to the bullpen. I'm just saying, like, it, there was some serendipity there, but the point is, is failed starters can make great relievers. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right, and and your point's valid, but I, I will always defend Dayton Moore because I remember word for word what he said at that press conference, and they asked about Wade Davis and what they were going to do with him, and they said, you know, we know James Shields is a great starting pitcher. We think Wade Davis can be a, a, a very good starting pitcher, but we know he can be a lights-out reliever. That was the term that he used. That, that's fair. You can't roll your eyes. That, that, that's no, 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 I'm not said. rolling. I'm, I'm acknowledging, yes, you may, I just... Like I and I like I, I'll give them credit that they knew he would be valuable in some capacity, whether it was as a starter or as a reliever. I do think that they got a little lucky in the sense that he could have been a good starter. He could have he could have been James Shields, and he would not have had as much of an impact on the Royals postseason run as he did as a reliever. Like I don't think anybody expected him to be to have one of the great two-year stretches in Major League history for a reliever. An ERA of one in back-to-back -back seasons that happened to coincide with two, you know, runs to the World Series. And then in the playoffs, I think he had, uh, you know, he gave up like two runs in 25 innings between the two between the two postseasons. So my point is, is simply that most of the Royals' relief success, like you said, I've been guys who couldn't make it as a starter. And the reason I think, if you look at the, the the common thread there is the Royals just seem to have difficulty teaching teaching guys to have three great pitches. They have a lot of guys who have two great pitches. I mean look at the bullpen now. Like Josh Stomont has incredible fastball and a really good curveball. Right? Scott Barlow has that great slider. But like to be a starter you need three pitches. And whether it is, you know, Brady Singer being being as successful as you can be without a third pitch. Brad Keller kind of being in that same boat. Um, what makes Daniel Lynch unique among this group of young pitchers is that he does have he does have that third quality pitch, and I think that's the thing the Royals are struggling to do is develop. To be a starter, you need to have three pitches. Unless you're Randy Johnson and you just have two eighty pitches out there, you need a third pitch. And the Royals just seem to have difficulty getting guys to throw three average or better pitches well and let's be clear as to why wade davis made 24 starts that year um which which in that 2013 season the the leaders on the on the ball club for starts james shields 34 jeremy guthrie 33 Irvin santana 32 what do they all have in common wade davis 24 i'll put him in there as well what, what do they all have in common well, they weren't developed by the organization that's right that's right and i'm checking i can't remember who had it was mendoza signed no, I think he was also – he was like a minor league free agent, if I recall. Yeah, I think so. And then – so he wasn't. Yeah. Bruce Chen, next. You got to get down to Danny Duffy, who made five starts <clears throat> that year before you find a Kansas City Royal. Well, it, basically, the two guys on that team, yeah, Danny Duffy and Jordano Ventura, who are really the two – only two guys this organization has really developed, were the only two guys yeah. developed in the organization who even made one start for that team. Right. What, what the problem is uh, – for why Wade Davis was allowed to make 24 starts and wasn't immediately slammed into the bullpen, locked and loaded and used as a weapon, and maybe, you know, br bringing a playoff season together, was Luke Kochaver failed, Mike Montgomery failed, uh, Aaron Crow failed, Kyle Zimmer failed. All these guys that could have been part of the yeah. equation, right, all failed. Danny Duffy made it as, I think, a third rounder, but who was the other guy? Was he a second rounder? I thought he was a sandwich pick. It was Duffy Montgomery, uh, you know. Oh, um, uh, Chris Dwyer, John Lamb, John Lamb. Uh, yep. That that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, Dwyer too, but uh, you know all those guys. I mean, like none of them, none of them could could be a starter in the big. There, there's the reason why that after the 2013 season, the world uh, said that they were going to have a major announcement, and then we were all expecting them to, to to sign an elite free agent, and it was Jason Vargas. And there was a reason why they said that was a major announcement because they needed Jason Vargas because they couldn't develop pitching on their own, right? They needed a guy to come in and throw 180 league average innings. And Jason Vargas actually worked out very well for what the organization needed. But the fact that they needed him in the first place is the indictment here, right? Because aside from, again, aside from Duffy and Ventura, I'm looking at the 2014 and 2015 Royals, the only homegrown guys who made starts besides Duffy and Ventura, Aaron Brooks made one start for the Royals. He was the second guy in the Sean Manaya trade, uh, as you, you may recall. He was, I think, drafted by the organization. That's it. 
That is the only guy in 2014 or 2015 besides Duffy or Ventura who made a single start for the Royals. And that's the Royals at their best. They just have not been able to develop young pitching. I mean, the reality is they are developing right now with, with Lynch and I think Brady Singer is going to be back in the rotation pretty soon here. I, I think that they're having as much success developing starters right now as they have since Dayton Moore has been in charge. They just, they've never had a, a settle a down. Maybe. Settle down. I like this from Nick. He says, hope this isn't a dumb question, but can't they draft pitchers who have three good pitches or is that uncommon? Uh, the Royals have been, are, have, have held on to this. What are they? What do they want to curve? And, and, you know, this, this antiquated 1980s Braves philosophy and, it, it's it's killing them, right? Do they want projectable guys where the Rays want so, uh, just everybody to be different so that no matter who steps on that mound, it's a right. different look than everybody else. The Royals actually want everyone to be exactly the same. <laughs> exactly the same. <laughs> Throw the same pitches from the traditional slot. Like it's it's our it's it's really very outdated uh, how they go about doing it. But it's a good I will point. say in, in their defense, I will say when you say draft three good pitches. It's really hard to, you know, if you if you have three major league ready pitches and you're in the draft, you're probably going to be, you're like a top five pick, right? right. The, the one guy that, that actually kind of fit that was probably Kyle Zimmer. And they drafted him and he just absolutely could not stay healthy for the, you know, to save his life. Unfortunately, it's just, um, so I'll give he them has a all- fresh arm, Randy he has a fresh arm because he hasn't been pitching that long. Yeah. Yeah, that might that might be he also hasn't proven that he can hold up to the rigors of pitching, right? That's the, the yeah, flip exactly. side of that. Well, I, do, but, I don't think Brad Keller has either, but we're not going to go back down that road. Why yeah. not more bullpen games? Why not at least a freaking opener for this team? What why are they so when they have so many spots in the rotation that are just crap? Dude, you're you're preaching to the choir. I mean, because they did it out of desperation this week, one time and we worked with wildly successful game spire was was their opener and through two perfect innings and it's frustrating because game spire is an example of the fact that somewhere in this organization there has to be somebody who actually is teaching people teaching guys how to pitch because game spire was a completely unheralded guy he was the second guy the royals got in a trade when they traded john jay remember john jay like yeah. fourth outfielder for life, John Jay, to the Arizona Diamondbacks back in twenty what twenty eighteen. They got Elvis Luciano, I believe, who was ended who ended up being uh, picked by the Blue Jays in the Rule Five draft. Um, he was like the talented young art. He was the lottery ticket. And then Gabe Spire was this kind of like uh, you know twenty three year old double A lefty reliever. It was just just an arm, and there was really nothing about him that said this guy's going to be a major league pitcher. And suddenly, in twenty last year in twenty twenty one in in Triple A, the year before he had, um, well, I guess twenty twenty there was no minor league season. Twenty nineteen, he had twenty six walks and seventy three strikeouts in Triple A. Last year, nine walks, only two of the uh, two of those were intentional, so only seven unintentional walks, fifty seven strikeouts. He had a strikeout to walk ratio of eight to one. Pitched for the Royals late in the year, and then this year in the major leagues, this year and last year, he's thrown twenty and a third innings, zero walks. And 13 strikeouts. Gabe Spire is legitimately looks like a guy who could be a, a, a seventh inning option out of your bullpen from the left side. You know, he's gonna have value. He's under club control for five years. And they, they took a guy who nobody considered a major league pitcher, really, and, and turned him into a guy. They can do it in the bullpen. So why don't you just have a bunch of guys who are relievers and have them throw, like you said, two innings and just Get 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 away from th- having a starting pitcher in, in, at all. Just every fifth day, you start Gabe Spire or someone like that, Ronald Ronald Bolaños for two innings, and and see if that or works. maybe three. I mean, to me, the way I, I believe that pitching is going to go is you're going to be viewed as a nine batter guy, an eighteen batter guy, and a twenty seven batter guy, and then the rarefied air of somebody who can turn it over into a fourth time. But right. if you're turning over a fourth time, it better be just for a couple of hitters because you're throwing a three hitter that night and going to finish it off in the ninth up eight one. Um, but I, I, yes, if you can have, if they don't legislate that out of the game by minimizing the number of pitchers you have, it's, it's what they should have done. It's what everybody should have been going to a long time ago. It just takes simple math and one they won't do peeves, it. One of my pet peeves about the sport. It's a, it's a, really, it's a minor thing. It's an accounting thing. 
but it annoys me because I think it actually affects the sport is the fact that they have not repealed the, the rule from like 1876 that says in order to get a win, if you're a starting pitcher, you have to throw five innings. And because it actually affects the way it real, I really think this delayed the implementation of the opener strategy, because if you're a pitcher and you're, you start the game as an opener, you have no, there's no way you're going to get the win. You could be perfect. You're not going to get the win because you're not going five innings, but you can get the loss. You give up a run, you get the loss. If you come out of the game with, with losing, you get the loss. If you come out of the game with a lead, you get nothing. It's a literal no-win situation. Like, why would you do that? And if you repeal that rule, I mean, the Royals just this week left Zach Greinke in in Colorado on Friday to try and get the 15th out and almost coughed up a lead. He had to come out of the game after four and two-thirds innings, which means Zach Greinke who's having a good year, is 0-2 as a Royal this year. Things, some things never change, but it's a dumb rule. If you got rid of that, I think you would see more teams embrace the strategy of forget forget about five innings, just well, go as hard as you can for as long as you can. I, I agree, and I think teams like the Astros and the Rays do. I mean, I think it's, it's right. teams like the Royals that have Ned Yost and Mike Matheny. Exactly. You know, it would be good help the Royals to get rid of that rule trying to get their guy a win. Gosh darn it. We're going to get you a win today, Zach, instead of going out there and winning the damn ball game. And, and, and I mean, like they, they literally began like there, there was a little fire, you know, there, the Royals had this big lead. There's a little fire and they left Zach out there going <sighs> blowing on the fire. Like we, we need to get this really hot. Like, why would you screw around with that? I'm like, just take him out. Tonight's not the night. You, Especially like, in Coors Field, like you know, yes. it's like you know, Zach was doing. You can pitch well and just be unlucky, and, and as we saw today, you can have a six nothing lead in the seventh inning and, and be down, you know, three out, you know, by the end of the inning. It's like you don't, you cannot let that fire smolder at all, and it's a dumb rule. And but smart teams have ignored that dumb rule, and the Royals are still feeling their way there. How many times, um, you know, are are, are they going to? Make decisions based upon individuals' numbers, and and watch free agents not sign with them, and have have Kumar Rocker tell you we're not going there. I'm not signing with you guys. Like it, it like the whole like the one thing I, I listen. I appreciate any company or organization treating their people well. I think every company should do that. But you know, you got to make the product right. Like like the restaurant that treats its people well doesn't go hey. We're just gonna have a party here. Nobody's coming in. You, you got to open the doors, and everybody's got to do the job. And and they they are so much more about, like I said, the Make a Wish Foundation is the only thing I can think of. It's like what they're <laughs> fulfilling major league dreams and careers and statistics of players, as opposed to winning baseball games, which is what you're there to do. Like set that crap aside and win baseball games. That's what it's all about, and they don't seem to want to do it. So, I, so, so, I so do, did Ryan, Ryan O'Hearn make a wish to be in the major leagues for four years? Was that the? I guess that, yeah. that would ex explain it. So. I guess. Well, well, how about Whit Merrifield playing every day? Why does that happen? I mean, the, this is these are the trophies that don't matter. Like, what is the club record? That's, that's the classic one. I mean, wh what what are they like? Is there a number we have to? And, and he's hitting now, so it's probably the wrong time. Or, for three days or four in, days in Colorado, yeah, <laughs> Colorado. He's sure. hitting, but you know, he's hitting. So let's let's give the guy some credit. He's he's hitting the ball. But is it is it you know uh, like is is this really what is this going to do? Are we trying to get him into the record book? Because you know you, you you know you still feel guilty about leaving him down for Mondesi, and so well let's get you this. Here's another place we can put your whoa, name in the record whoa. book. Look, consecutive game streaks. For any team, it's 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 a like I said, it's a trophy that not only doesn't matter, it's probably a trophy that hurts you in the long run because there have been studies that show that a player who plays 162 games in a season tends to fall off late in the year. Fatigue is real, right? We we you know we have load management in other sports. No other sport do they play 162 games in 181 days or whatever it is. And let's let's think about the the granddaddy of all consecutive game streak, Cal Ripken, right? Cal Ripken, two thousand six hundred thirty two games. Do you know what Cal Ripken did late in this late in the season? Usually, and and here's the thing: we didn't know this back in the nineteen eighties. Something for for you youngins out there, something as basic as what was a guy's statistics broken down month by month. We didn't have that information. Right. We didn't have it at all until 
the late 80s, early 90s, maybe the Elias baseball analyst. We certainly didn't have it at our fingertips until, really, until baseball reference in the early 2000s. Uh, but let's l- l- look at it real quickly here. OPS by month, Cal Ripken, for his career. And he was in a consecutive game streak for pretty much his entire career. Right. April, 791. May, 792. June, 812. July, 819. Warmer months of the year, you heat up. August, 766. That's still a hot month. And it was the lowest of the five. And then September, 748. He definitely had a small but measurable impact that over the course of his career probably was worth a couple of games worth of performance. You know, he would have been just as valuable, probably more valuable if he had played 158 or 159 games in a season. And Cal Ripken was indestructible. And Cal Ripken was also a Hall of Famer. Whit Merrifield is not a Hall of Famer. I th- and he's not 24 years old. Maybe they should give, you know, and he, he, until this weekend, he wasn't hitting. So, yeah, this uh, consecutive game streak is pointless. Who I think who, the guy who has the record, right, is Alcides Escobar, I want to oh, say. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and same, same administration, you know, same kind of mentality. He wants to be out there every day, but was he really helping you every day? He wasn't a superstar. I think you could survive one day a month without Alcides Escobar in the lineup, but the Royals just chose not to do that. Uh, Merrifield became the first player in history to play in 500 straight games and extended the longest consecutive games played streak uh, in the major since Prince, Prince Fielder. Prince Fielder. Okay. That's which... where we're at. Uh, this is from, I'm, I'm seeing this note, Merrifield, when he got to 500. So Escobar actually, yeah, I guess he made, yes, he made a longer yesterday. streak than Escobar. Escobar had led, uh, played 162 games in 2014, 2016, and 2017. Uh, he was on the, the 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 IL briefly in 2015. So so Merrifield may even have a longer streak there. Yeah, he does. He has the longest one. Yeah. So because longest according one to this thing that I just okay. I, I just okay. So, but Escobar Escobar, you know, was the longest in recent history before that, and it says he has no interest in a day off as the streak reaches 500. I mean, which is I was like, it's not up to you. And I like, was going to say, I'm like, I don't think Wally Pip wanted a day off either. That's not your, it's, and, it's, and, not, it's not his job to ask for a day off. It's, if you'd given him a day off, you know, two years ago, this would be irrelevant. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Are we going to be having a conversation about MJ Melendez? Or are you fine with what, how they're using MJ Melendez? I, I think we need to figure out what, what is MJ Melendez first? And, you know, there was that one lineup where he was slated to play, I think, right field, and then the, the game got rained out, and so it never ended up happening. But, you know, there, there, it, it spurred a lot of talk of, you know, should the Royals be moving Melendez around in order to get his bat in the lineup? And I may be in the minority on this. I really ju- I don't like the idea of having him move around because if you believe that he is a catcher, if he if you believe that he can play every day as a catcher, in the major leagues, I feel like moving him around, it's not like moving Bobby Witt between shortstop and third base where the, where the job is essentially the same thing. You know, you're, you're, you're move, you're 30 feet farther over, but frankly, when he plays third base in the shift is on, he's playing shortstop, right? There is no comparison to catching at any other position on the, on the diamond. And Particularly uh, what we've seen from him already, he's you know he's got skills. He yeah yeah I think his pop time he he threw out a runner today. His pop time the time from the the time the ball hit his glove to the ball hitting the second baseman's glove on the stolen base attempt was I think like 1.87 seconds, which is one of the lowest times you know recorded this season. So the skills are there, but he's but he is very raw. Like you see it, he's let a lot of balls get through him. Um, as he's already given up like four wild pitches and a pass ball in just four games behind the plate. Um, so he needs to develop back there. If you think he can, I think moving him around is just going to impede that development. But I think the question is, do you think he can catch the major? This is a major league level. And this is one of those things where the Royals have to be honest with themselves. Because if he can't, if he's never going to be, even if he can be okay, but not good enough for you to trust him as an everyday guy, then you have to decide what to do with him because he does have the bat that I think he has a bat that can play at other positions. So if you want to move him, like I wouldn't dabble with him in the outfield, but you want to move him to the outfield and you think he can be an everyday right fielder and has the range to do it. Cause he's still young enough. He still has speed. He still has some speed, but catching is going to wear that down. You do not move a guy to the outfield 
you know, when he's t- after he's been catching for five years, unless he's Craig Biggio. And Craig Biggio is one of the fastest catchers we've ever seen. Um, so I think the Royals have to make a decision and stick with it. Either he catches, he's a, either he's a catcher, in which case he catches, whether that's in Omaha or in Kansas City, or he's not a catcher, in which case you got to figure out where he's going to be in the long term. Maybe it's third base. Maybe you move Witt over to shortstop. Um, I just I think this idea of moving him around from one position to another is a bad idea. Well, and, and the, my frustration is that if you're left him at catcher all the way to this point, it was because you're either going to trade him as a catcher, maximizing his value, or you're going to trade Salvador Perez and open up a catching spot for him. And instead, they seem to have done neither. And that's the frustrating It's, it's the same. That's the Brad Keller issue all over again. Exactly. It's like, that's the other option. If you don't think he can, but other teams think he can catch, then trade him. Get the value that he's, you know, going to bring you on the market. Because that's, you're talking about Brad Keller may or may not fetch stuff. MJ Melendez will bring you something in the market. In, unless, no unless you let him play for a year and a half and, and, and move him all over the place and depress his offensive numbers to where it's like, no, nope, can't hit. There are lots of guys who look like they can hit, roar through the minor leagues, get up to the big leagues, and th- there's that pitch that they can't hit. There's something that they can't see. Well, and if, that's, think he, if that's going to happen, then trade him before he shows that. While he's still you have to know that. And they don't seem to know it. They right. seem to, because four years of Brian O'Hearn, they're still waiting for when that all clicks. You know, I mean, today I, I, I'm happy for the kid, but uh, Emmanuel Rivera, right? Uh, the mm-hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, the third base. Yeah. Uh, doesn't look like to me he's going to be the everyday third baseman, but we know he's gonna. They're gonna give him a bunch of at bats to find out because they don't know either. So, Ren, I, I sometimes I, I wonder what we're doing here. here. Here we are, you and I, having a very long, thorough discussion about what the Royals was like. You know, should Brad Keller be extended? Should the Royals, you know, move MJ Melendez? And meanwhile, the Royals are like, we're going to keep playing Ryan O'Hearn every day. It's just like we're on we're on two different planes of existence here. I, he did I, I get don't a hit know. Today. He did get a hit today, and and I, and I hate I hate I'm not going to root against Ryan O'Hearn or anybody wearing a Royals uniform, but. There was a like, oh God! Now we extend this. Well, and it was well, a big, hit. It was a big hit in a big in the you know in a big rally in the ninth inning. It was, a, and, it was and, and I wish they they need somebody in there, and maybe this is Sam Ellinger's job to listen to what they're they're saying in some of these interviews and go, you know, listen, just as a guy who's covered the team, this is when you say that this is what they all think, right? Like it's like, oh, Ryan O'Hearn gave us a good at bat. You know what that is? They they like everyone's like really, like you're gonna like the one time. It's like Johnny made a poo. Johnny made a poo. Look, good boy. Johnny made a poo. Johnny's sitting on the big boy body. It just you know when when we the number says two fifty on his on his uh um you know hell on his on base percentage. Wake me up. Let alone his batting average. For God's sake. Right. Uh, let's, let's finish. Let's, with, yeah, I was gonna say, let's finish with a little bit of good news for. I just want to quickly shout out to Bobby Witt Jr. The home run yesterday, the home run today. That's not actually not what I want to shout out because I mean that's great. But well, in my Colorado. defense, I, I did bring up the 2012 Royals and the fact that sometimes you can't see it when hope is there. So I, I, I will say that I, I gave. That was your Bobby Witt Jr. segment? That was, that was my silver okay. lining part. Yeah. Okay. Well, Bob, I just want to say, though, and yeah, he homered today, he homered yesterday. But it's Colorado. Sometimes, you know, guys hit home runs there easily. What really impressed me, what what I, I wouldn't say impressed, what relieved me was he drew, he drew two walks today. Because coming into today, you know how many times he had drawn a walk? Three times all season. And it it he has it's Royals disease. They take a, a great hitter, a hitter who has the ability to command the strike zone, and they make him, or I don't want to say they make him swing at everything, but they certainly don't emphasize swinging at pitches in the strike zone. And he has so much talent. If he would just not swing at pitches out of the strike zone, he, I think he's going to be a star. But we know he's swinging at pitches out of the strike zone because he only drew three walks all season. And that's, I mean, it's his, his walk rate, he's on pace. He was on pace to walk like, what, 18, 20 times all season? Like, he should, he should have eight or nine walks easily at this point. So now he's up to five. But I think he his numbers have definitely shown a progression you know, from the for his first three weeks in the majors and uh, t- until today, he had the same adjustment period in Double A last year. I'm really hoping he's turned the corner. He's adjusting. He's that th- this is what we've seen from Bobby Witt over the last two weeks. 
is a more patient guy who's going to wait for the, a pitch he can drive and crush it. And if he doesn't get a pitch he can drive, take the first base. And guess what? When he's on first base, now you got one of the fastest runners in baseball on first base. It's also help his pad his stolen base totals. We know how much the Royals love stolen bases. That's what's so frustrating is that they don't like walks, and yet the easiest way to steal second, the first thing you have to do if you want to steal second base is to get on first base. So hopefully we'll see a guy who walks more. That means more steals and more home runs as well. Uh, Randy, great stuff as always, my friend. Uh, they have, I want to point out, here's another ray of hope. They've won three out of five. They did take a series against the uh, Colorado Rockies. So uh, maybe better baseball is, is you know, starting to play. They're going to just little by little uh, get things going there. If they go, if they win three out of five the rest of the season, they'll, they'll make the playoffs. Yeah, well, that's yes. That's how the math works. <laughs> that's it how takes, it works. We're it still takes, early. It takes a big doctorate brain like yours to, uh, <laughs> to give us those kind of nuggets. All right. Listen, if you haven't done it already, we'd appreciate it. If you hit that like that love button it does a lot for us. Doesn't cost you nothing. Uh, if you're listening to us via the podcast, you can catch us. We stream live 10 o'clock on uh, Twitch, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and Twitter. And of course, if you're catching us on the stream, wherever you get your podcast. I'll look for Kaufman Corner. You can catch it there. Make sure you subscribe. And make all your friends subscribe as well. Tell all your friends about it. So for Dr. Rainey Gisarelli, my name is Seren Petro saying thanks for joining us here on Kaufman Corner.